The rubber hits the road this year. Very important, very important year. When Philadelphia's new superintendent of schools made that statement, he was confident there'd be educational progress, students moving up, not walking out. Probably in a popularity contest, uh, I wouldn't win very many friends, but I didn't come here for that reason either. I came here for children achieving. After two years, David Hornbeck's relationship with the Philadelphia Teachers Union seemed beyond repair. The man will not listen. He will not cooperate. It is not in his nature. He does not respect the sanctity of a contract. It's the history teacher. This is a lesson that we teach kids, the sanctity of law, agreements. That is a strategy that Federation leadership has used, is to object, expect the district to say, oh my goodness, uh, and, and then not go ahead. And life's too short to play the game that way. So you just go ahead? We go ahead. David Hornbeck's we go ahead approach to school reform would not win a popularity contest, at least not as far as the Philadelphia Teachers Union was concerned. Hornbeck came to Philadelphia in 1994 as superintendent of schools with a comprehensive revolutionary plan to reform the system. In his first two years, he challenged the union on two big issues, seniority and accountability. He lost badly both times. What the union did not realize was that in his third year, David Hornbeck had one more card to play. The Merrill Report. School Crusade, the reality, is made possible by the people of Toyota. And by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. David Hornbeck came to Philadelphia in 1994 with a dream and a plan to save the city's failing public schools. He called it Children Achieving. After two years of 12-hour workdays, he continued to believe that his vision would transform the failing system. If we succeed, then um, nowhere in America can it ever again be said that, um, uh, that uh, our kids can't achieve. Hornbeck was ambitious, but untested. He had never worked in a school or run a school district, but he had been Maryland's state superintendent for 12 years. He had also received national recognition for designing a school reform plan for Kentucky. Most school superintendents hold degrees in education. We pray for children. But Hornbeck is a minister kisses and a lawyer. Kisses of flowers who hug us in a hurry and constantly lose their lunch money. And we pray for those also who never get dessert, mm -hmm. who have no safe blanket to drag behind them, who watch their parents watch them die, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, and whose monsters are real. Hornbeck's Children Achieving Plan called for a new way of thinking about education. More accountability, higher standards, a streamlined bureaucracy, more technology, and the belief that all children can achieve at high levels. Hornbeck was comfortable using biblical terms to describe his agenda. One does not put new wine into old wineskins. All right. All right. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. Mm -hmm. The fresh wine skins Hornbeck envisioned involved the school bureaucracy. In most school districts, the central office makes the decisions. It picks the textbooks. It decides when schools open and when they close. It may even regulate the thermostats. Hornbeck broke the school district bureaucracy into 22 pieces or mini school districts. He called them clusters. Each cluster of 10 to 15 schools would make the educational and budgetary decisions for those schools. Clusters, Hornbeck said, would mean better education for children and a more efficient use of money. Hornbeck wanted to give each cluster its own budget, but because of money problems, only 25% of the schools, six clusters in all, 
actually got money for reforms. Does this, in a sense, mean that we will be running two different systems within the district simultaneously? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Do we have any alternative? No. During his first two years, the new superintendent got his own on-the-job education about Philadelphia politics. His chief ally was Philadelphia's mayor, Ed Rendell. People are saying, well, you're actually the linchpin. I mean, if you or your support wavers, he's in big trouble. I don't think he has to worry. My support's there for the long run. I think David Hornbeck has to be given an opportunity, and an opportunity here is four or five years to see whether he can make a dent in these problems. The mayor evaluated his protege after two years. I would give David uh, an A on enthusiasm, an A on ideas, um, an a, a on commitment. I mean, he's taken a lot of grief and probably a D on political skills. But he's getting better on political skills, too. I'm very optimistic, and I give Dr. Hornbeck an A. Thank you for our superintendent. The Reverend Robert Shine of the Black Clergy of Philadelphia shared Hornbeck's vision. Commitment. Thank you, Lord, for his committed staff that they too, like the dreamer, have a vision for our people. I feel the passion that he feels about it, and I'm inclined for educational purposes to um, join with him in whatever manner I can. Gail Tomlinson of the Citizens Committee for Public Education in Philadelphia was less enthusiastic. Give David Hornbeck a grade. C minus. At the beginning, we were talking about a vision, which is, as most visions are, a perfect vision. Um, but it's making the vision real that always presents the problem. David Hornbeck's been here for two years. Give him a grade. I would give David Hornbeck's uh, program an F. An F? An F. An F for fraud. Kirsch's union, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, has a reputation for effective bargaining and an historic willingness to strike. Hornbeck and the union clashed during his first two years on two major issues, teacher accountability and seniority. In June 1996, union members authorized a strike. All those in favor of authorizing the executive board to conduct a strike Please rise as you give your answer to I. But it was averted at the last minute. I think that the members of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers are going to be very, very pleased when they hear the details of the contract. From the beginning, David Hornbeck said that student achievement was his bottom line. Success for him meant changing what was happening in the classroom, more learning. Now, Hornbeck had not been able to raise enough money to put children achieving in all of Philadelphia's 257 public schools, but it was up and running in 64 schools. If children achieving is making a difference, we ought to be able to find the evidence in those schools. Clara Barton is one of those schools. It's an elementary school, kindergarten through fourth grade, with 875 students. When Hornbeck arrived in Philadelphia, Barton's veteran teachers were skeptical of reform and reformers. This he's superintendent he's is a... here for these few years. A new superintendent will come in with a whole new program. And I've only been here for 22 years. And in terms of being in the trenches, so to speak, right. I don't see Nothing any difference. Changed. My day-to-day -day activities haven't changed. The school has changed, however. Enrollment has grown steadily. Most of the new students are from immigrant families. There's at least six languages in my class, children who speak six different languages. Technology is central to children achieving. When Hornbeck arrived, Philadelphia schools had one up-to-date computer for every 30 to 40 students. His goal was a one to six ratio. He persuaded IBM to donate $2 million worth of equipment and services. And that's a powerful tool for uh, youngsters who face major barriers to reading, like being learning disabled or uh, being a youngster whose first language isn't English. And Barton in Philadelphia is the place that all that's being developed. Clara Barton received 18 computers on March 18, 1996. The new computers were set up in three classrooms. But there's another room up there that needs two PCs and two monitors. There were a lot of problems in the beginning. We didn't know the problem or the uh, programs 
weren't all installed. It was enough to get started with the reading and the writing because they're only seven and eight years old. This is the first year I ever had, a, I ever used computers. Yeah, it was pretty hard at first, but then once we get used to it, it's pretty easier. Teachers use the new computers to help students learn to read. You know what this is called? This. Yeah. Right. Well, if I don't know the word, um, and the panda will say it, and if I don't know what's the book about, I can click on the eye on the top of each page. And now I give out uh, hall passes. They can come in in the morning and use them. They can come back at lunchtime. So we're, they're always, they, they want to be here all the time. In the mornings, I like to come in and take off my coat and I, I put everything away. Then I go straight to the computers with my friends. And their writing has improved immensely. And I've had a writing workshop for years, and this is the best I've ever had. And it motivates children who ordinarily don't care to write, you know, because they want to type on the computer. It's just amazing. I had no idea when I got started on this that it would come to what's happening now. And I think it's great. One classroom used the new technology to create a TV studio. Do you speak in your country? About where students recorded book reports, produced a news program, and interviewed guests. Why on a set? <laughs> Tell me something about your job. Well, the most fun part of my job is getting to come like this morning to your school here at Barton and see all the children hard at work doing things like interviewing superintendents. Now they're very cool about it. They just ask them what their job is, and if they like their job, and if they want to be president, and, and stuff like that. Would you like to be for president? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get a scoop here. Right. I would like That's to announce here. <laughs> Clara Barton also benefited from full day kindergarten. How many people are happy about being here today? Yeah. I am. Yeah. Are you I happy? Am. I'm very happy about being here today. The really exciting thing to see what that really means uh, is to talk to first grade teachers who have had the experience of having youngsters come from half day kindergarten versus youngsters who come from full day kindergarten and they see a big difference. The first grade teachers this year told me that uh, the children I'm getting are reading, are all reading and they're reading on a better, le a higher level than they were last year. Children Achieving allows individual schools to make important decisions about curriculum and teaching. Clara Barton has chosen a new math, reading, and science program. So we're going to be using it for reading, writing, social studies, and science. Does David Hornbeck in central office sort of tell you what to do, or are you making decisions here to change? No, our, pr our principal brought the program in, told us about it, and we decided to do it to see if we can help the kids achieve more in reading, language arts. So we brought it in. And I think that's initiated because Hornbeck wants to see changes in schools that need to improve. Toward the end of Hornbeck's third year, the teacher's skepticism was vanishing. I mean, it wasn't a haphazard thrown together program. They equipped the schools with the furniture they needed, all the equipment they needed, the hands-on things, the books. They, they did They've a good job. They've never done that before. Well, we talked last. One of the questions I asked you is, do you, have, do, you, do you feel the effect of whoever is in running the system? Well, I guess as, as we talk about it, we do. I mean, classes are put together and you actually get supplies for new classes. We have full day kindergarten. The teachers have started to notice a difference in the reading levels of children. Yes? Teachers say that Clara Barton is a better school today and they credit children achieving. Now Barton is one of 64 schools out of 257 that got Hornbeck's children achieving treatment. If the other 63 turn out to be doing as well as Barton, then you'd have to say that Hornbeck's crusade to save Philadelphia schools is a success. But reform is not that simple. Like Clara Barton, Alney High School received many of the children achieving benefits. Alney has 3,000 students and 160 teachers. The school is just a few blocks away from Barton, but light years away in terms of educational achievement. 
90% of Olney students scored below basic level in reading. 96% scored below basic level in math. Many students drop out. We have 1,350 ninth graders. We have 350 seniors. How many kids will graduate? June. Um, probably about 325. I think we'll be close to the 350 if they've lasted till they're seniors. Safety and discipline are problems at Olney. What do you have, DeWine? <laughs> On my way. What do you think adult women do when they get angry? Why was it necessary for you to get so bent out of shape in the first place? very difficult for me to teach in a classroom and be accountable when I have kids running through the hallway, when I have a gang coming to my door yesterday looking for a certain kids in, in my class. Very difficult to have children achieving. We need to uh, help students with social behaviors because that plays a big role when you're learning. Children attending has to come first. Uh, children um, uh, going to class once they're attending has to be second. Children, children behaving in class, uh, in the school, has to be third. Then we could have children achieving. Alney is uh, a very difficult high school. I declared it a so-called challenge school. Challenged is education speak. It means poor performing. Basically, it puts the school on probation and gives the superintendent the power to appoint a new principal. Appointed a woman named Renee Yampolsky, who's a dynamite uh, principal who was at Central East Middle and um, I thought did a terrific job there, um, very aggressive. Renee Yampolsky is a graduate of Olney High School. Maybe this can be my shining star. Come back and make my alma mater the kind of school it was when I went here 40 years ago. My dreams and my plans aren't different. If my plans work, my dream will come true. Uh, Alney High School needs a complete renovation, um, academically, right here, and physically. The next wall is going to be over here, which will separate both the ninth grade small learning community and the sports and recreation small learning community from the lunchroom. For physical renovations to make sense, students had to be there at school. Too late now. Too late now, all the way around, son. Hold up, all, all the way around. All the way around. Okay. Renee has begun to try to take steps to, to deal with that. Not always within the rules. Uh, um, she, uh, uh, she locked the kids out one day uh, who weren't there on time. Uh, and that's not strictly in the rules. Yampolsky warned students that lateness was unacceptable. Yeah, these three are the last three. Come on, you're in. You guys, all the way around. She told the students that she was going to lock the doors at one minute after eight, and she did. And we turned away between lateness and absences, 1,300 kids. Out of? 3,000, almost half. And we got some phone calls from parents who were upset, and they came in to see me, and I explained that for a month and a half, these kids have been late to school. This month, I was only late three times. Yeah. All right, over with the ID. But a whole lot more kids were on time the next day uh, as a consequence. I really wanted to do it for a week, but the parents called downtown to central office, and I got phone calls pretty quickly to not do that again. You were breaking the rule. That's correct. <laughs> Our superintendent said to us, which has been my philosophy all along, um, if you ask, they can say no. If you don't ask and you do it, you, all you can do is get your hands slapped. And I think that, um, I think a good leader like that needs a lot of support uh, in the process. Hornbeck wanted principals and teachers to have a lot more power. I think a team of teachers at the local school and their principal ought to get to decide who's going to teach at that school. Um, and um, seniority gets in the way of that. Seniority means that teachers with the most experience get first choice of where to teach, as long as they have been rated satisfactory. 
Teachers at Olney High School believe in seniority. Does that strike you in, as the right way to run, run a school? That the administration has no control over who gets to come in and teach there? Yes. It does? Mm -hmm. If you were a principal, would that w work for you? Well, as long as I've been rated satisfactory, why would the principal object to me coming here? Do you think the principal ought to have some say in it? A chance to meet you and see if there's a, some kind of meshing? They might not like the way I comb my hair, John, and uh, you know, not choose me on for, that, uh, for that fact. To someone from outside, it... It's astonishing. Now, why did you use that adjective? Why? Because where, where do you go where you have no choice over the people who work for you, for whom you are responsible? for whose performance you are um, graded on. Would you, as a teacher, like to have some say in choosing your colleagues? No, I wouldn't. Um, I haven't had a problem working with the colleagues that I walk into a situation. Would it make it easier to collaborate if you had a chance to pick the team ahead of time? I'm, I'm sure it would, but I, I, don't, I don't see where, the, academically, that would be a difference. Uh, if you I, were I would be a, looking for friends. <laughs> but that seniority rule is important to you. It's the sacred cow. Hornbeck had tried to change the seniority rule in his contract negotiations with the union. The PFT resisted. I think that what Hornbeck wants is the total right to assign people wherever he thinks they should be assigned. And this union can't accept that. You wanted to make a dent in the seniority rules. That's right. And you failed completely. And, and we more or less failed to do that. Hornbeck also confronted the union on the issue of teacher accountability. He did not like the current approach, in which school principals evaluate teachers as satisfactory or unsatisfactory based on how they meet their professional responsibilities, their preparation, attendance, and control of the classroom. Teachers are not evaluated on whether their students are learning. He was very attuned to the likes of the children. You're asking, can you evaluate a teacher on the performance of the students? And yes. And yes you, or no? No, you cannot. You cannot evaluate a teacher on right. the performance of his or her students? Right. Hornbeck wanted to connect student achievement and teacher performance. He failed to do that. And we know that the superintendents have the current accountability program and his punitive concept of punishment appears nowhere in this country. But Hornbeck did not quit. Having failed on teacher accountability, he created a school accountability system based on teacher and student attendance, graduation rates, and test scores. On Hornbeck's school rating system from 0 to 100, Olney got a 40. Is there a connection between Teaching and learning? Absolutely. But there's also a connection between what goes on in the home and what goes on in the neighborhood. In a video, Hornbeck warned that low-scoring schools like Olney could be taken over if they did not improve. Well, my employer uh, has declared war on me. Okay? Uh, David Hornbeck and uh, the administration have presented us with a video that says they're going to go after us. But we've been too timid too cautious about student achievement for far too long. And it's really a lousy feeling to come in every day to want to do your job, knowing that your employer is going to go after you or your colleagues. I know that what we had before was not working, and so we have to try some new things, so. We will provide every support possible to work through this process with you, because this professional responsibility system is not about fixing the blame. It's about fixing the problem. If we don't have staff who believe in it and want to do it, then we're not going to go anywhere. We're just going to be where we are now. I think most of my teachers are capable of being good teachers. I'm not sure that most of them are capable of making the change. There's a difference. Are you taking steps to try to move those people out of the school? Well, I'm trying to do one of two things. Either I'm trying to get them to buy into making this place the kind of place that I want to send my kids to, or leaving the school. Do you have a quota of teachers that no. you want to get rid of? I have a feeling about um, how many really special teachers I have. 
Because of seniority rules, a school principal cannot order teachers out and bring in new ones. Neither can the superintendent. But David Hornbeck had a card to play, keystoning. The union contract allows Hornbeck and the union to work together to pick out academically distressed schools and keystone them. Basically, that means take them over and transfer 75% of the teachers to other schools in Philadelphia. Keystoning would give Hornbeck accountability and a way around union seniority rules. But keystoning would be a big gamble for Hornbeck because all eyes would be on whichever schools he chose. At the same time, keystoning would be a showcase. It would give Hornbeck a chance to prove to the city of Philadelphia that children achieving could work. But which of Philadelphia's academically distressed schools to Keystone? Hornbeck had plenty of choices, but Olney had Renee Yampolsky, a leader who'd already demonstrated that she was willing to take risks. One less class to prepare for. I'm here this afternoon because I have decided uh, to declare uh, Olney uh, and one other high school in the city a Keystone school. He named Olney, he said, because its test scores were low and because its teachers were not willing to work as a team with the new principal. The reaction was immediate. Okay, this is an absolute fraud. It's been perpetrated on us by the administration. It's been perpetrated on us, not only on the students, but on the faculty also who have built their careers here. I, will, I am very proud to be an Olney teacher, and I will be very proud to be the first one out of here. Were you shocked when you heard the news? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, of course I was shocked. You're shocked and you're stunned to, to see what's going on. When you label the group, you're laying the labeling the entire staff. Very hurtful. Teachers felt that Hornbeck's Keystone Declaration blamed them. Because everybody in here has basically been <coughs> besmirched in one way or another. My friends come up to me and go, what kind of school do you teach in? And this has been killing me. All these students responded. For three days in a row, they walked out of classes. This school had a stranglehold in the Philadelphia media. It was in the newspapers, on just about every TV station. You couldn't get away from it. And behind us right now, students are now forming a big union out in the middle of the street. We understand that we're still being keystone, but we didn't sit and take it spoon-fed. We did something about it. We worked together, and we, were, we stood together on this. We knew that this is not something that we wanted to happen. OK, here come the Omni students right now. They are marching down Front Street. They are chanting, no keystone. They are all mar marching together. It happened anyway. Because we're only high school students, there's only so much we can do. David Hornbeck came to Olney on the first day of the student walkout. The reason I made the decision that I did uh, last Thursday arises uh, not from something that has happened in the last six months or the last year, uh, but a history that um, exists here at, um, at Olney. The fact that uh, not a single student ended up at a satisfactory level in reading or in math or in science. And the fact is, uh, I'm not going to put up with that anymore. So that's the bottom line. Down the hall from Hornbeck and the students, Ted Kirsch was talking to teachers. So the question of why Olney, we believe that it's arbitrary, it's capricious, and it's a whole lot of other things. So the next question is, what's the union going to do about it? This morning, uh, I've instruct, I instructed our attorney to go to court to seek a temporary injunction to stop the process. That's number one. Number two, we have filed an unfair labor practice. Kirsch claimed that Hornbeck had kept the PFT out of the decision-making process and asked the State Labor Relations Board to overturn the Keystone decision. We have no, no say in what is happening to us. And I think that's what's really ticking a lot of us off. This is a battle. And in battles, it's, it's actually, it's a war. It's not just a battle. This is just another battle in the war. And we're just going to keep fighting and fighting. And hopefully, we're going to be victorious in this one. He has stressed to the max, staff and students, um, 
I've really, I resent it. I'm very angry about it. This what I'm saying. It's embarrassing. This is so embarrassing. We are on the news. We are constantly being like on on the newspaper. The front of the newspaper Friday. That is so embarrassing. And it's like we've been here for four years. And now you're trying to tell us that we're not learning enough. No, I'm saying to you that you haven't learned as much as you should, and that you can. Do we even count? No, I think that that's I think that's fair, and and. I think that we ought to and we will work with you. In For some, example, Hornbeck's promise of communication came too late. Standing next to Ben Soleil, what do, you, what do you feel about today? It looks like everybody's out here. Well, one of the biggest reasons was the little meeting we had yesterday with Mr. Hornbeck. He answered no questions, and we just ain't going to stop until, you know, he, Mr. Hornbeck acts like he wants to do something other than be so stuck up in his decisions. If the bottom line is for children achieving, why not? All of us work together, communicate, decide what we want to do together, because there are more stakeholders in this whole process other than just teachers. I would say it's something similar to where maybe a chef. You can't go into a kitchen, throw a bunch of food in a pot, say, here, that's soup. You got to take the soup and you got to make it slowly. You can't make a radical change and expect everybody to say, oh, I accept that. Mm, yeah, that's good. You know, I'm not against change. Change is good. Involve the people you are going to change. Hear their input. Discuss. Create a plan. And if then everybody has ownership. Everybody feels like they're on the same page and they're moving together. Hornbeck meets every month with parent organizations. In April, he defended his Keystone decision. I expected, quite frankly, more people to say, why in the world did you wait so long? How could you possibly have let this go on as long as, as you did, instead of, why did you do this? But my concern is that when there's a major decision made and parents were not included in that decision, then I have some concerns because then that begins to tread on what I do and what I represent for parents. But see, we're spending almost all of our time on the way it was done rather than getting on with change. But, but Mr. Mr. Hornbeck, that's, that is such a key point in terms of the language of children achieving says that there will be involvement, there will be consultation, there will be participation. And then when there is not, that's a fundamental betrayal and of what people have been told. If the observation is that we haven't gotten it all right, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, betrayal, gosh, that's an awfully strong word. Hornbeck's supporters rallied behind him. Hornbeck. It's impossible to argue with what David did. Given the record of performance of those schools, what what else? You know, what else can you do? Were I Dr. Hornbeck, I would have done exactly what he did the way he did it for the purposes that he did it for. You cannot accept that level of performance. So I think radical change was necessary. But had Hornbeck followed the rules for making radical change? The school superintendent violated every step along the way of the agreement that we had on the reconstitution of schools. In May, the union and the school district presented their cases before an arbitrator. The PFT said that it had been excluded from the decision-making process. The district said the PFT had turned down an invitation to participate. Then they waited for a decision. That is a strategy that Federation leadership has used, is to object, expect the district to say, oh my goodness, uh, and, and then not go ahead. And life's too short to play the game that way. So you just go ahead? We go ahead. He does not respect the sanctity of a contract. It's the history teacher. This is a lesson that we teach kids, the sanctity of law, agreements. You can't keep violating it and then blame the other person. That's what he's doing. The man will not listen. He will not cooperate. It is not in his nature. He's like a petulant child. It's either his way or he's going to go after you. The next thing I expect him to do is throw himself down and bang his head on the floor if he doesn't get his way. What if you lose? What if an arbiter says you cannot keystone? him? Well, I, I think that's sad. Um, I, I really, again, I, I don't understand why the union um, keeps defending the status quo. To the I mean, union leadership, keystoning was part of Hornbeck's larger secret agenda. Well, I think his strategy uh, is based on a survey that we have uh, 
found out about, where a political consultant said, make the union the enemy. And therefore, all of the actions uh, coming out of the administration building are pointed towards the union, the baddies. That was in June 1996. It came up again in April of 97. Now, we have talked to people who have seen the report. I mean, this isn't paranoia on our part. The union says there is a report written, supported by foundations, advising you that the way to win this struggle to reform Philadelphia schools is to make the union the enemy. Is there such a report? Those recommendations uh, have been made to me, but, but there's, not, there's not a report. Where's this report? Ah, uh, if you find it, I'd like it. <laughs> the $64,000 question, because if we had a copy of the report, uh, everything that we have been saying and everything that we have alleged would be in black and white. It came up again two months later in June. Yes, there is a report. Nobody seems to have it. Uh, if it really is not damaging, then why don't they show it? I've got it. Ooh. <laughs> How did you get it? It doesn't say what you said. Uh, what, what report did you get? I have both of them, the two documents. Which two? I'd love to Prepared read. for the Greater Philadelphia Urban Affairs Coalition. No, that's not Robertson, it. Robertson, Lair, Sawyer, Miller. Achieving reform in Philadelphia schools. Focus groups? Coalition, yeah, focus groups, the whole thing. Got it, both, all of it. I want to know your reaction to it's not saying demonize the teachers. Well, then they left, then you don't have the full report. If these are the actual reports, and we haven't seen them, then why is it that we have been saying this for more than a year, we have gone to a variety of sources, to get it, why wouldn't they give it to us? Why wouldn't they come out and say, union, all these things you say, it's wrong. Why? Can we have a copy before you leave? <laughs> Hornbeck brought in a new standardized test, the Stanford 9. When the so-called SAT 9 was given for the first time a year ago, confusion reigned. The first time we took the SAT 9, we took it in the lunchroom. Chaos. Yes, chaos, total yes. chaos. Did anybody know about the test? No. Because no, I didn't know. We didn't before. know. I came to school and went to sleep on the test. I laid on the test and went to sleep because yeah, I didn't know what it was for. The administration was told that, don't worry about this. You know, it's just one of these tests. We want to see where we are. It doesn't count. And I was surprised, quite frankly, at the number of reports that I've had uh, that staff in schools basically told the kids not to take it seriously. Um, I thought that in the instances where that happened most prominently, um, that that was really quite unprofessional uh, to understate it somewhat. The results shocked Philadelphia. Only 46% of high school students could read at a basic level. In math, only 24% reached basic level. Before the test was given this year, the school district mounted a public awareness campaign. If your children are in Philadelphia public schools, they're about to take a very important test. Don't let anyone tell your children this test is not important. It's not a test you can study for, but you can help your child in a few simple ways. Make sure they get a good night's sleep before the test. Tell them to relax and just do the best they can. Help your children get ready for the future. Make sure they take the SAT-9. All right, take your time. Try Testing to conditions were changed. Pace yourself. And what about this time? And this time they took it in classrooms, sitting in classrooms, Separate controlled tests. environment. They kept students out of the hallways during the test. Hornbeck says he changed procedures because he had learned from the first year's mistakes. The union has a different interpretation. We felt that the process was, from the very beginning, not uh, honorable, that it was set up to get positive results. So the superintendent could come around uh, and say, see, my system works. Uh, test scores have gone up. You expect the test scores to go up? Yes, yes. What do you expect the union to say when the test scores go up? I think they're going to have this uh, huge urge to think up some reason why the test scores aren't valid. They did everything that they could to have low test scores the first time and did a whole lot of different things this time to improve the test scores. Second year test scores did go up at Olney and at most schools in the city. It's not a real indication of what students have learned 
it's more public relations and selling of a program, and that's why there's no great enthusiasm, even if it looks good, it's been staged. To say that they're invalid is going to say that all that hard work by teachers and principals uh, doesn't make any difference. Alney High School may help you. Back at Alney, Principal Yampolsky was moving ahead to change the school into seven mini-schools. Under the rules of keystoning, she could keep only 25% of the teachers. 75% had to leave. But which teachers would apply to stay? Which would she keep? There are some people who are excited about the idea that this place could be really different and they applied. But there's an awful lot of pressure being placed on people. You have encouraged people not to apply. That's correct. You have used the word scab. That's correct. Why do you say that? Uh, because this is my job, okay? I have a job here. I've done nothing wrong to lose that job, and someone else is coming in to take my job. Have you applied to stay here? No, I didn't. Would you want to stay here? It's difficult to work under situations that cause stress. And uh, it's been very stressful. Have you applied to stay here? Yes. Was that a difficult decision? Not really, to be honest. Uh, my life is here. It has been for 25 years. Bill Cohen. Mm -hmm. Good guy. Great teacher. Hard worker. He's applied. Yes, he has. You're going to accept him? Absolutely. But he doesn't know yet? No. Nervous? Very. My gosh. I'm, I'm not retiring in one or two years or I wouldn't mind kicking around someplace. I have goals I haven't met yet. I have children, literally, that depend on me. I've got, you know, more to do in this system that I think I can do. 63 of Alney's 160 teachers applied, and Yampolsky chose 40, the maximum allowed. They met to discuss plans for the new year. For 25 years I spent my life at that school, and with the people in that table and the people at this table, we can make Alney High School greater in the next 25 years, and I want to be a part of that with these people. To replace the 75% who would be leaving Alney, Yampolsky and the school district held recruiting meetings. The union sent a letter to all of its members and spread the word elsewhere. Do not apply to work at a Keystone school. If they do. If they do, I wish them luck. They're going to have serious problems in dealing with the situation at Alney. And I think that the record indicates that the vast majority of our members have stayed by uh, the leadership of the union. They have not applied. That's why they can't get uh, the teachers. The school district had invited 200 people from across Pennsylvania and from other states to this meeting. Ted Kirsch sent eight union staff members. You know what, you people better think about this. The teachers that they got rid of, they will do the same thing to you. So you're giving these out, do not apply for yes. positions. Like here comes someone. What looks like about, what, two dozen teachers have come in? Are you disappointed that teachers? Is this like crossing a picket line? No, oh no, no, no. We have no floor with the teachers who are here because most of them are long-term substitutes. It just seems unusual that you're leafleting at a meeting. It just seems like a... Well, the school district did not inform us of this meeting. We want to let you these people are, know what they're up against. To let them know, they, and you are free to talk to them exactly when they come fine. outside this meeting. And when, but but it's we have members for you to take we have over. members here, and we have a right to be protected. And they, and those rights will be protected. Not, not by you, not by you. And you are free to talk to your members anytime that you, you want, but this is a meeting that was set for a certain purpose, and it is rude to disrupt it. It's a violation of our contract to have it. It's not a violation of the contract to have it. Um, I'd like to introduce... Uh, my name is David Hornbeck. I'm the superintendent of schools in um, Philadelphia, and I simply wanted to uh, come and 
um, add my own welcome to you to this, uh, this meeting. You may have noted, whether in the press or in this room this morning, that there is some small measure of controversy. You have to be ready to make change, and change is difficult, and change is pain painful. And if you're willing to make change, you can work together as a team and do it. If you have a significant number of people who resist change, it's difficult to work with that staff. And the decision to change the staff did not point fingers at any one individual in the school or any group of individuals in the school, but looked at a fresh start for kids. Tension mounted at Alney during the recruitment period as the adults in the school chose sides. Teachers who had been friends for years stopped speaking to each other. Yampolsky's car was broken into and her school records stolen. A lot of mistrust was bred over the months uh, on all sides. There's been some pretty nasty behavior. As teachers packed up their belongings, material they'd accumulated over years of teaching, the administration became suspicious. When they were carrying out cartons, we asked if we could please see what was in the carton so that we could try to control uh, equipment, books, materials, leaving the building so that when we open in September, we have some stuff to get school started with. That resulted in what is not a particularly unusual set of events where um, boxes are leaving institutions and security look inside of them. I mean, you go down to almost any building downtown and you'll find that just as a routine matter. Do you and have reason to suspect that we teachers, had, some teachers were taking I stuff do. that belonged to the school? I do. As a matter of fact, um, I had notified um, security on May 7th that we had two incidents of equipment missing from places that um, kids rarely go. This most recent week, there was a situation at one of our high schools, uh, Alney High School by name, uh, where the principal ordered the faculty parking lot closed, where cars blocked the parking lot. And I think that what happened here was school security um, got a good deal more aggressive. People were searched, their personal goods were searched. That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable search and seizure. If you had it to do over again, what would you do differently? I don't think I'd do anything differently. I certainly wouldn't have allowed that situation where they blocked off the driveways. I would never have allowed that. But that was a decision that was made because there was no administrator on spot to make that decision. The fact is that um, um, when something is done inappropriately, uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. There was a letter in every teacher's mailbox by 9.30 the next morning apologizing uh, for Your the, apology. My apology. The union was not satisfied with the apology and filed another lawsuit. And the, the anguish that the people at that school have suffered on top of the other indignities that have occurred at that school, the locking of the, the files, the police uh, state atmosphere that's been created. We are going to go to federal court. We're bringing suit against the superintendent, the school system, and the principal. Over the summer, Yampolsky and Hornbeck moved ahead with plans for a new Alney. But on July 9th, 1997, the arbitrator threw out keystoning. In his decision, the arbitrator criticized Hornbeck. He said that Hornbeck had not consulted with the union as the contract requires. I would hope that the superintendent will finally come to realize that he has to adhere to not just the language of the contract, but the spirit, the intent. This was to be a cooperative effort and every step along the way as the arbitrator points out the school district violated what they had agreed to do leaving aside whether or not it complied with the legal requirements of the contract the way he did it uh, was destined to create problems for himself fair to say you blew it um, from my perspective not at all I, I think david is weak on politics and i don't mean democrat or republican or dealing with the mayor or dealing with the city council i mean the politics of, of of trying to make your case for action before you do it we're an open book um, and in my judgment that belies the notion of not listening of of um, not wanting lots of folks inside the tent of this business of my way or the highway and all that. Um, so uh, 
um, I guess that's, that's my view of, of that particular charge. With keystoning overturned, all these teachers were no longer required to leave the school, but one third of them left anyway, including Edna Barnes. Tony Kalalango stayed on. And so did Bill Cohen. On the first day of school, September 4, 1997, Alney High School, although not keystoned, was new and different in some respects. We will be using five entrances for entering school and for leaving school. What was not different at Alney was the tension. Renee, you know what I mean. Look, you have no high school experience, so let me tell you from a person who does. Every comprehensive high school has a roster chair and grade chair people to help in this. All of Philadelphia's 257 public schools opened that day. Superintendent Hornbeck visited several of them, including Welsh Elementary School. Okay. Nice to see you. It's how I looked on my first day of school. I felt happy. Happy. Yeah, that's great. Welsh was one of 92 schools whose Stanford 9 test scores had increased by at least 5%. You guys have been working hard with good results. Thanks. Test scores went up, and so did the number of students taking the test. Hornbeck worked to see that children with mild and moderate disabilities and children whose first language is not English took the tests. Those students generally do poorly on standardized exams, making the increase more significant. I don't want to overstate, don't want to make claims about that, that aren't there. Um, I'm just uh, delighted to see the beginning edges of genuine, measurable, significant change. Ted Kirsch, who earlier had been skeptical of the SAT-9 exam, was complimentary. And so this year now becomes the baseline uh, for next year because that's the way we're going to be able to show progress. I agree with Ted. Publicly, at least, the climate seemed to be changing. I think there's a recognition that uh, the challenges we face are not as much between each other as they are uh, beyond ourselves. Maybe there's more of a realization that there are people on the outside saying, hey, look, we know both you guys. Uh, you, you guys have to, to go forward together because we know you both are capable of doing it. Perhaps they are capable of going forward together. But right now, their fundamental positions have not wavered. I haven't changed my opinion uh, about the su success of, of children achieving. Uh, I don't think it's reaching out into the classroom. I don't think that the real impact is felt by the teachers. And until I see a change, I'm going to continue to say that it is it has failed, that it hasn't been successful. You said the PFT was standing in the schoolhouse door. You still feel that way? Uh, they have been standing in the schoolhouse door. Sure. The mayor has said very clearly that as long as he is mayor, that David Hornbeck is going to be there. I understand that. And, and my answer is when you say what to move the school system forward, I think it should be different. With the reality that David Hornbeck is going to be here, I understand that. David Hornbeck has begun his fourth year in Philadelphia. Is children achieving a success or a failure? It's probably too early to tell, but Hornbeck has accomplished a lot. Full-day kindergarten, more technology, a streamlined organization, and in some parts of the city anyway, a renewed sense of hope. Perhaps in another city, Hornbeck would have accomplished more. Not all teacher unions are as difficult to work with. Right now, Hornbeck's job is getting tougher, not easier. He's facing a budget crisis of major proportions. He's going to run out of money, if not this year, then the next. He's suing the state over funding. And on this one issue, the union's on his side. We can argue later about how you spend the dollars, but together, we've got to go get those dollars. Without a major change in Harrisburg, um, one of two things is going to happen next year. Um, either we are going to decimate the school system, and by that I mean wiping out all of kindergarten and books and computers and everything of any pretense related to reform, um, or um, we won't be able to, um, to, to make the year and, and the school district will just shut down. If we don't get adequate funding, 
uh, there is no chance, in my judgment, no matter how good David's ideas and concepts and changes and reforms are, there is no, no hope. So it remains an open question. Is it possible to reform an urban public school system? Suppose it's not. The implications are frightening. To find out more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. Production of Learning Matters Incorporated and presented by South Carolina ETV. The Merrill Report, School Crusade, The Reality, was made possible by the people of Toyota. And by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. For a free companion guide or to purchase a video cassette of this program, call 1 800 553 7752 or write to the address on your screen. This is PBS.